Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, friends and colleagues. I'm Wafa El Sadr. I'm the Global Director for ICAP at Columbia University, and I want to welcome you all to our 2020 World AIDS Day event. This year has been like no other. We've had to confront uh, two pandemics at the same time, HIV and COVID-19, an unprecedented situation. In many ways, this year has challenged us all personally and professionally. Many have suffered great personal losses and difficulties. At the same time, on a professional level, many have had to work hard and work differently, not only to um, zealously uh, safeguard the gains that have been achieved in global health and in the HIV response specifically, but also to sustain the momentum and the trajectory uh, towards ending the AIDS, the AIDS pandemic. We have also found ourselves at the very same time compelled to pivot to tackling COVID-19, a great new threat to global public health. So today we will have the opportunity to reflect on tackling two pandemics, HIV and COVID-19. Let me tell you about what to expect today in terms of our agenda. As you can see in this slide, we will first start by a welcoming keynote address uh, by uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Fauci is the director of the National Institute of ha Allergy and Infectious Diseases. He has been a great leader and a champion for the HIV response since the very beginning of the HIV epidemic, and has most recently been as well a great champion for the global COVID response. He is someone who has been steadfast, standing strong and guiding us through turbulent waters over the past year, as well as over the past uh, several decades. We welcome uh, Dr. Fauci, and uh, we can move on to his presentation. Thank you. Greetings, my name is Tony Fauci and it's my great pleasure to speak about ending AIDS at the Columbia University's ICAP's Special World AIDS Day event. I also thank you for all your good work, especially during these difficult times. As you can see from this first slide, I'm gonna focus my discussion on a combination of ending the HIV AIDS epidemic at the same time as we talk about maintaining progress in this endeavor during the extraordinary challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic. Just to refresh your memory, many, many of you remember that in March of 2019, we published in JAMA an editorial outlining the plan for ending the HIV epidemic as a epidemiological phenomenon in the United States. Uh, first, obviously taking a look at the challenge, we all know the numbers. We have 1.2 million people living with HIV. The important number on this slide is the 38,000 people who are newly diagnosed with HIV every year, literally for the last more than a decade. The demography of this is very, very critical. They're mostly men who have sex with men, African-American, the Latinx, and younger individuals. So we were going to and have been, in many respects, focusing on how we can address this very disturbing pattern that we've seen for a number of years now. The goal of this plan for America to end the epidemic was to reduce new infections in the five years by at least 75% and reduce new infections by 90% in 10 years. To achieve this goal, we're gonna diagnose, treat, prevent, and respond to potential outbreaks in a very efficient manner, appreciating clearly that if we did this and the hypothetical pattern shown here with a 75% reduction by the year 2025 and a 90% reduction by the year 2030, we must overcome what is now clearly recognized as the implementation gaps in addressing the HIV pandemic shown here from testing to treatment to retention in care to viral suppression that's prolonged to prevention and harm reduction services to the food and housing insecurity 
to human rights, including stigma and discrimination. We wrote a paper in JADES in December of 2019 about the importance of the role of implementation science in getting these gaps filled. Now, many agencies have a number of uh, uh, um, goals that overlap, complement, and synergize with each other in this, mostly in the Department of Health and Human Services. The NIH role is a number of different components to it, but implementation science is one of them. Having said that, where do we need to focus our efforts in this plan to end, end the AIDS epidemic in the United States? I have referred to this as the HIV vulnerability profile that has two components, a demographic component. Here we know very well the great disparity that we're experiencing here with 13% of the US population being African American and 43% of all new diagnoses being among that demographic group. And among those, 60% are men who have sex with men and 75% are under the age of 35. I'm gonna be getting back to this slide as we transition into a discussion of COVID-19. The other part of the HIV vulnerability profile is the geographic. As we know from this map that there is a concentration now of infections in the southern part of the country with 52% of the new infections, a new HIV diagnosis occurring in that region of the country. So this map prompts me to now make the transition that we're gonna get into in a moment in looking at first COVID where we are and how this interdigitates with our attempts to end the HIV AIDS pandemic. This is a map of the United States. Now we're in COVID. We have now 13 million cases and over 265,000 deaths. The color code with dark shows the distribution in cases per 100,000. Globally, this is the worst public health disaster and crisis that we've had in 102 years with 63 million cases and almost 1.5 million deaths over a period of less than one single year. If you look at the slopes of the surges that have put us into the difficult situation that we are in now, even as I speak, where we had an early spring surge dominated by the northeastern part of the country, particularly the New York metropolitan area. Then in the early summer, in attempts to open up the country from an economic standpoint, the southern states such as Florida, Georgia, Texas, Arizona, and Southern California had a surge. But right now, what we are experiencing literally now is an extraordinary uh, surge that is highly steep in its, in its uh, increment here uh, experiencing literally in more than 40 of the 50 states and in the territories. So what I'm going to talk about in the next several minutes are both the indirect and the direct effects of COVID-19 on persons with HIV. Let's first take a look at the indirect effects of this historic pandemic on persons with HIV. We know now that if you look at the, that the impact of the pandemic in low and middle income countries uh, on HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria, that in high burden settings over five years, you can have an increase of 10, 20, and 36% respectively for HIV, TB, and malaria. This will spill over into the United States because when you look globally at disruptions in services with uh, 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 medical services such as the delivery of antiretroviral therapy in 32% of 101 nations, malaria diagnosis and treatment down in 46% of 68 nations, and TB case detection and treatment in 42% of 101 nations. You will see that if we get to a situation where we have interruption of services such as these, they will impact us in the United States. Let's quickly go to transmission of, um, of uh, COVID-19 or SARS coronavirus 2. We know the data now is transmitted by respiratory droplets as well as a component. We're not sure exactly what proportion, but clearly aerosol, the typical types of small particles that can stay in the air 
over time and distances. Virus is found in a number of bodily secretions. However, their role in transmission is unknown and likely not dominant. The risk of transmission varies by type and duration of exposure, viral load being important, viral load that is in the upper airways. Transmission is most common among household contacts, as well as in congregate or healthcare settings where PPE is not used. And it's clear when PPE is properly used, the rate of infection dramatically diminishes. Also, we see outbreaks in closed settings, such as cruise ships, nursing homes, prisons. And the factors that may increase the risk of this airborne transmission include crowded enclosed spaces with poor ventilation, as well as things that are not just coughing and sneezing, but singing, speaking loudly, or breathing heavily. The fundamentals to preventing, acquiring, and transmitting uh, SARS coronavirus 2, I speak about them all the time. There are five of them, the universal wearing of masks and cloth face coverings, maintaining physical distance, the six feet rule as we talked to about, avoiding crowds and congregate settings, particularly indoors and certainly with masks. Outdoors, things that we should be doing much more preferentially than indoors, weather permitting, obviously some states and locations as we enter into the winter makes this particularly problematic and the frequent washing of hands. An extraordinary part about this entire outbreak is that about 40 to 45% of individuals who are infected with SARS-CoV-2 are without symptoms. And we know that asymptomatic carriers clearly can transmit infections and are probably an important part of the currently ongoing community spread. Clinical manifestations are manifold. Early on, they clearly resemble a flu-like syndrome as shown by the manifestations and the percentages on this slide. There is an interesting and curious in a significant proportion of individuals, loss of smell and taste preceding the onset of the respiratory syndromes. For those who do get symptoms, about 80% are mild to moderate and about 15 to 20% are severe to critical with a case fatality rate ranging from a few percent to about 20 to 25 percent of those requiring mechanical ventilation. The manifestations of severe disease are dominated by the acute respiratory distress syndrome, but also having a degree of cardiac, neurological, kidney involvement, and a curious hypercoagulable state characterized by microthrombi in small vessels and thromboembolic phenomenon seen sometimes in otherwise well individuals. There's also a multi-system inflammatory syndrome first described in children and now seen in adults that resembles Kawasaki syndrome. Now, who are the people at increased risk for severe COVID-19 illness? And here's where we get again to the interdigitation between COVID-19 and HIV persons living with HIV. First, there's older adults clearly have a higher degree of susceptibility to severe outcome. If you look at the rate of hospitalization per 100,000 based on age, this slide speaks for itself. When you look at the younger individuals on the left-hand part of the slide and the elderly on the right. If you look at today, people living with HIV, 51% of these people are ages 50 years of age or older. This is critical when you think in terms of all of the liabilities associated with aging in the general population with regard to severity of COVID-19 manifestations, this becomes relevant. And then we get into the direct effects of COVID-19 on persons with HIV. We all know that HIV has been studied now with regard to what we have been referring to as premature aging which is a potential risk factor for severe COVID-19. There have been a number of papers written about that, the premature aging related comorbidity, comorbidities associated with HIV infected persons compared with the general population. This may be critical when one thinks of the role of comorbidities and that's exactly what's pointed out on this slide. People of any age, with certain underlying medical conditions referred to as comorbidities 
are at a higher risk of a severe outcome. These are the medical conditions that are clearly associated with an increased risk of severe COVID-19. You see them there, obesity, diabetes, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, smoking. Many of these are at an increased incidence of persons living with HIV, particularly as you get into the older age group. Those conditions that may confer increased risk for severe COVID illness are shown here, but note among these are immunocompromised state. So one might think since HIV is in there, but it actually is a little bit more complicated than that because a person who is infected, who, excuse me, a person living with HIV, who in fact has a relatively normal CD4 count on antiretroviral, undetectable viral load, that in and of itself does not put a person at increased risk. What does is the HIV comorbidities has prevention as potential risk factors for severe COVID-19, as I mentioned, especially in older individuals. Carlos Del Rio has written about this in the New England Journal of Medicine, where the comorbidities were the major drivers in severe COVID-19 in persons with and without HIV co-infection. And again, when looked at individuals with HIV in a multi-center research study, the higher mortality was seen in persons with HIV was driven not by their HIV, but by the higher burden of comorbidities. Now, when you get into racial and ethnic disparities, they are profound when you're dealing with COVID-19, both in the incidence of getting infected, and again, in the comorbidities that African Americans, Latinx, Native Americans, Alaska Natives, and Pacific Islanders have in their comorbidities as part of their normal demographic profile. You see this expressed in the rate of hospitalizations. Compare the rate per 100,000 population of hospitalizations and look at the top three bars of Latinx, Native Americans, and African Americans compared to white. The 400s compared to 100. Getting back to the slide I showed you just several minutes ago, when you look at the disparity when you're looking at HIV alone. So those are the overlapping disparities that we see between HIV and COVID-19. Now, if you wanna end the COVID-19 pandemic, that will clearly facilitate ending the HIV epidemic in the United States for the reasons that I mentioned over the last several minutes. They overlap, they interfere, and they interact with each other. How do we do better? We optimize the COVID-19 treatment and prevention toolkits. Let me quickly run through these. First with therapeutics, we have therapeutics for early and moderate disease, therapies for moderate and advanced disease, and adjunct therapies. I don't have time to go through each and every one of these, but I'm sure many of you are following this, the emergency use authorization for things like monoclonal antibodies for convalescent plasma, the clear, clear use of and, 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 and actually very, very um, important advance in something as simple as the use of dexamethasone in people on ventilators or requiring high flow oxygen. We're gonna be seeing more of these therapeutics as we, as we test more of the direct acting agents as well as additional monoclonal antibodies. And finally, vaccines. We've taken a strategic approach to COVID-19 vaccine research and development by harmonizing the protocols so that we're studying six candidates, five of which are now either completed or in phase three trials, three separate platforms, mRNA, adenovectors, VSV vectors, and protein subunits with an adjuvant. The results, as I'm sure many of you know, have been striking. We now have at least two of these candidates, one in Pfizer, which is an mRNA that has a rate of viral uh, of vaccine efficacy of 95%, no serious safety concerns, and clearly it's effective in preventing severe disease. The same holds true for Moderna, another mRNA, 94% efficacy, and again, quite effective or efficacious in preventing in the vaccine group severe 
disease. Another vaccine that has been studied by AstraZeneca, a little bit more complicated about this because of some confusion in the dosing, but I think at the end of the day, this may again yet be another important addition to the vaccine armamentarium. The critical issue is we've got to get people vaccinated, people particularly in the minority groups. If you look at the skepticism and the outright refusal of people not wanting to get vaccinated, it is serious and needs to be overcome. And again, the overlap of the people who are the most vulnerable. If you take a look at the bottom of the slide, African-Americans and Hispanic have more skepticism about that. Those are the people that are disproportionately represented in the COVID-19 group and disproportionately represented in persons living with HIV. So this is the group that we need to reach out to to make sure they get vaccinated. And even when we do get good uptake of the vaccine, we've got to remember we cannot abandon public health measures such as the simple things of wearing masks, avoiding congregate settings, washing your hands, and keeping distance. Because we will not yet get a veil or an umbrella of herd immunity over the country until a substantial proportion of the population is actually vaccinated. Let me end by just showing this slide of the COVID-19 prevention network. If anyone would like to see the kinds of things that are going on in this network, as well as you might wanna inquire about the possibility of volunteering for some of these prevention studies, you can do so by logging on to this website. I wanna stop there and again, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation. And thank you very much, Dr. Fauci. Thank you again for highlighting the um, remarkable advances in, in confronting COVID-19 uh, and highlighting as well the intersection between HIV and COVID-19, as well as highlighting the disparities that remain and some of the implementation gaps uh, that remain ahead of us. And we will touch on some of these issues uh, during our panel discussion. Let's move now uh, to a, a brief uh, featured video presentation. We all know COVID is very new. It's a novel disease, and uh, people are still learning. You know, the outbreak of I mean, COVID-19, you know, uh, has made me more worried about ever and about ever before. Everyone was scared. Statistics show that every day we have more and more people infected. We are doing a big survey to evaluate the HIV impact on the population and taking into account that um, our work is connected with a very special group of people and they have to continue their treatment, they always have to have medication. How would their life continue without our workers? Most of medical workers were at risk. They uh, were on the front line of fighting COVID-19, but at the same time they were continuing their work with people living with HIV. So because of that, we, we thought it wise to have uh, our healthcare workers being trained. And what we actually did, ICAP actually uh, gave us opportunity. The first protection starts with IPC, that is uh, Infection Prevention and Control. What we've learned, we are going to put into practice, especially the hand washing. Standard precaution, more of hand washing. I pass I I cap clean up. They supply us items like sanitizer, liquid soap. So I cap are really trying. So with this IPC training, I mean it helps us to protect ourselves and the patient and even our community. All the staff received some gloves, some face masks, and also some hydro alcoholic shake. We are here in our offices today to do the cleaning of uh, deep cleaning and sanitizing of the offices. When you go inside, there's a stand here where you will sanitize yourself first before you enter the, the offices. We are the task force, the 
national COVID-19 COVID and this is my vehicle. What we are solely responsible for is for us to ferry the returning residents to the quarantine centers. So we set up a monitoring system for remote coaching and data collection. We also uh, made targeting activity for distribution of IT and condom. So that they don't feel forgotten, they don't feel left by. We have been working with EPHI to support the COVID-19 testing. Most of these COVID-19 testing sites are also a viral load and ID testing sites, so we, we need to support both the, the uh, HIV laboratories and the COVID-19 testing. I cap leadership has been working with CDC to procure and feed the cup of the supplies that has been shared by the COVID-19 testing and uh, uh, HIV uh, laboratory. So all those who are supporting us out there, thank you for the support. We are doing it for our country. As you know, it's humanitarian. What, what gives me hope in the midst of the COVID-19? My daughter, <laughs> my family. When some one people are helping to others is very... I think it gives me the hope uh, and no one will uh, lose their hope in bright future. Thank you so much and see you. Bye-bye. And thank you all uh, for your enormous efforts in confronting both HIV and COVID-19 around the world. Uh, we'll move on to our next speaker, and our next speaker will be my colleague, Miriam Rapkin, and she is the Director of Health Systems and Strategies at ICAP at Columbia University. Welcome, Miriam. Thank you. It's a pleasure to join you for this World AIDS Day event. My presentation will pick up some of the themes that Dr. Fauci just mentioned with a focus on HIV programs and service delivery during COVID. I'll briefly describe the impact of the COVID pandemic on HIV programs and the people they serve, and then describe some of the adaptations and innovations that we've seen in response. As Dr. Fauci mentioned, and as you can see in the figure on the right, the COVID pandemic has had both direct and indirect impact on health systems. At the center of the figure, you can see that the smallest circle describes the direct health impacts of COVID-19 and morbidity and mortality. The next biggest circle describes the immediate indirect impacts on other patients and on the health system, and that's where my talk will focus today. But we also need to acknowledge the extraordinary impact on health and well-being represented in the two largest circles, which speak to both the short-term indirect health impacts and the longer-term impacts on social determinants of health. This figure highlights some of the areas in which the immediate and short-term indirect impacts of the COVID epidemic are already being seen. We're focusing on HIV today, but as you can see, services for tuberculosis, malaria, maternal child health, immunization, non-communicable diseases, and reproductive health are also being affected by COVID's impact on both supply of and demand for health services. On the supply side, the pandemic has reduced access to health services in multiple ways. Some services are being canceled outright to decompress health facilities, reduce crowd, and divert resources to the emergency response. Staff shortages are also a tragic consequence of the pandemic as healthcare workers fall ill and as their repeated exposures require repeated quarantine. Closed borders and shuttered production lines have also caused stockouts of medication, equipment, and supplies, all strained in some contexts due to increases in patient load. The pandemic is also causing decreased demand for health services. Fear of infection and stigmatization of health facilities and healthcare workers mean that many people are deferring health services. In addition, lockdowns and travel restrictions have prevented patients from accessing health facilities, as has the cost of travel in a time of economic hardship. 
The articles on the right hand of the screen highlight this decreased demand in resource rich settings, but the ripple effects are felt around the world. In past epidemics, this drop in supply and demand has had devastating health impacts. For example, in Sierra Leone, utilization of maternal and child health services dropped during the 2015 Ebola outbreak with predictable results. There was an 18% decrease in antenatal care services, a 22% decrease in use of postnatal services, an 11% decrease in facility-based deliveries, and unfortunately, a 34% increase in maternal mortality ratio and a 24% increase in the rate of stillbirth. The impact that's already been seen on HIV program is sobering but not surprising. The Global Fund conducts a biweekly survey, which most recently found that 72% of countries reported moderate to very high level disruption of HIV programs, and this was as of mid-November. Of note, 39% of the countries where the Global Fund invests also had lockdown in impacting HIV programs at that same time. We see similar data from this week's World AIDS Day report, which notes substantive interruptions in HIV testing, linkage to treatment, and prevention services. The projected impact on new infections and deaths is daunting to consider. So what are countries doing in response to these threats? The World Health Organization has specific recommendations to maintain essential health services in the context of disease outbreaks. On the supply side, the WHO recommends decompressing health facilities, protecting healthcare workers, and planning ahead to avoid stockouts. And on the demand side, they emphasize the importance of trusted channels of communication and community-based networks. In many countries, ministries of health and HIV programs were poised to make these changes in response to COVID because they had already been scaling up a new approach to HIV services called Differentiated Service Delivery, or DSD. DSD recognizes the importance of tailoring service delivery approaches for different groups of people living with HIV, which means that many countries have been experimenting with diverse models that vary the location of services, visit frequency, and provider type, adjusting the where, when, and who of program design. Differentiated Service Delivery is the focus of the Sequin Project, a 21 country learning network that's designed to accelerate implementation of high quality differentiated service delivery at scale. Sequin is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and led by our team at ICAP. The network fosters joint learning, exchange of best practices and diffusion of innovation. In fact, our fourth annual meeting is taking place next week. Uh, you can learn more about Sequin and about DSD on our website at the link here. The countries in Sequin and others around the world are taking multiple different DSD models to scale. The table on the right of this slide highlights some of the common models that are used uh, for people doing well on antiretroviral therapy. So but these are, are called less intensive treatment models. In the top left corner are individual facility-based models like fast track and appointment spacing both of which means that people doing well on ART spend much less time at health facilities than they used to. There are also individual community-based models in the bottom left corner. Many of these enable recipients of care to obtain refills and even ART initiation in the community. And some of the best known models are group models, which can take place either at the facility or in the community, as you see on the right. Commonalities across countries scaling up DSD include growing experience with community-based testing and treatment services, multi-month dispensing of ART and other medications and less frequent clinic visits, and the increased use of physical outreach um, from health facilities into communities, including the use of mobile clinics, uh, traveling healthcare workers, community venues, um, as well as the increasing use of phones, texting, and social media to support recipients of care. So, Within the first weeks of the reports of COVID-19 in Africa, we did a survey of uh, sequin member countries um, and every country in the network at that time had made substantive changes to their national DSD programs and policies within the first month. The most common adaptation was the expansion of multi-month dispensing or MMD. And this is 
what it sounds like. It's when you dispense more than a month's worth of, of antiretroviral therapy or other medication at a time. So instead of handing me, uh, you know, 30 pills for 30 days, you may give me three months, what's called three MMD or six months of drug at a time. So within the first month, 10 countries had expanded the eligibility for who was, who was able to get MMD. Uh, seven countries increased the amount of ART dispensed uh, via this approach. Nine had enabled um, multi-month dispensing for other medications like tuberculosis preventive treatment, um, and three had enabled MMD for non-communicable disease medications. Other common adaptations were canceling or redesigning group models to enhance physical distancing and safety, but also to leverage those group models to uh, empower recipients of care and spread correct information about COVID. In addition, uh, countries expanded clinic hours, expanded their fast track services, and also expanded community and home-based drug delivery, as well as accelerating the use of texting and social media to communicate with recipients of care. The next few slides give us a, a few snapshots of these adaptations in various countries. And I won't do any of these programs justice, but just wanted to give you a little um, bit of detail. So uh, South Sudan is not in the sequin network, but um, was a good example. Um, in South Sudan, the Ministry of Health and its the Ministry of Health and its partners, including ICAP, made great efforts to keep people on treatment. So people who were already diagnosed with HIV enrolled in care and treatment. Um, there was a, a really full full force effort to retain those patients, make sure that they had access to services. So the teams made phone calls to as many clients as they could reach, particularly those who had less than three months of ART on hand and dispensed six months worth of drugs. They prepackaged six months of ART and fast track clients coming to health facilities to sort of decompress and speed them along, make sure that they had six months of drug. They used motorbikes to distribute drugs to clients' homes and to satellite sites where they were doing drug distribution. Um, they initiated weekly Zoom calls for health workers and staff um, to provide remote mentoring training and program monitoring uh, in the context of uh, difficulty accessing health facilities because of lockdowns. They provided uh, personal protective equipment to protect staff and continue services. And this uh, intervention actually led to an increased number of people on ART during the first months of the COVID response. Mozambique launched a multimodal response. Um, the Ministry of Health and its partners um, initiated a lot of efforts to empower recipients of care to provide accurate information, training, um, uh, and uh, information about how to protect themselves and also information to try to fight stigma. Um, the programs reduced visit frequency to health facilities for people who were doing well, who weren't, weren't sick, um, including the rapid scale up of multi-month dispensing increased spacing of clinic visits. So to, again, for people who weren't having an acute illness, didn't need to be seen emergently, having them come less frequently, providing psychosocial support by phone, and as well, community-based services were delivered by mobile brigades and mobile clinics were launched in some areas to provide clinical services, as well as refills, both for ART and for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Health facility flow was also reorganized, both for safety and for speed, and there was increased uh, effort to provide supervision and mentorship online. And again, this was quite successful, although um, there are some uh, short-term interruptions, testing, linkage to treatment, and viral load monitoring all rebounded. It's a quick snapshot. One element of Tanzania's response was the rapid scale-up of community ART refill services. Uh, in districts supported by ICAP's FAKIA program, health workers moved services to the community via mobile clinics, cars, uh, and even boats for island communities and really escalated the amount of community-based drug refills. Ethiopia accelerated its scale-up of six MMD, the distribution of six months worth of ART at a time. Uh, at high volume health facilities in Addis Ababa, you can see that the percentage of people receiving six MMD rose from 25% in October of 2019 to 65% in September of 2020. So this wasn't a new project uh, caused by COVID, but it was accelerated by COVID. 
Myanmar is not in the CFID network, but I did want to highlight this example of differentiated testing services and to note uh, the country's use of multi-month dispensing for methadone maintenance therapy as well as ART, and in addition to some of the other innovations seen on this slide. The Democratic Republic of Congo also leveraged its experience with MMD, worked to move testing and treatment to the community, and used mobile services and online platforms to continue supporting recipients of care and healthcare workers. So what are some of the key themes and lessons learned from these HIV program adaptations? Cross-cutting innovations adaptations included a real focus on flexible person-centered services that de-linked medication supply and clinical care. They recognized that clinical care needed to be uh, provided at health facilities by health workers or some clinical care, um, but that other services could be provided in the community and that dispensing medications um, did not need to be linked to those visits. We saw across the board a scale up of multi-month dispensing of medication, whether that was um, expanding eligibility criteria or expanding the amounts of medication that were dispensed at the same time. A real focus on community-based services, uh, testing services, prevention services, treatment initiation and treatment support. And this took many different forms and shapes. So it included mobile services, fixed services in the community, home-based services, and many were provided with and led by community-based organizations. Countries leveraged technology, um, mobile phones, mHealth apps, social media groups, online platforms, both to reach recipients of care, to continue prevention, testing and treatment activities, um, but also to supervise remote health facilities to provide training and mentorship for health workers. There was a, a strong emphasis on multimodal communication. So, uh, communication through trusted networks of, of peers and community-based organizations, radio ads, social media um, campaigns to try to provide information about COVID both so that people could protect themselves, but also so they knew um, about the changes and adaptations in health systems. There was both national leadership, so we saw a policy change, um, you know, real commitment to um, trying to mitigate the impact not only of COVID, but of the COVID response like lockdowns, but also decentralized decision making. So recognizing that um, answers varied uh, not only from country to country, but from province to province and district to district. So there was a real acceleration of some of the activities that have been started sort of under the umbrella of differentiated service delivery. And during the, the last months of, of the, you know, the, the COVID epidemic, um, we've really seen that these DSD pro projects and programs had primed the pump and took off during 2020. And some of the key questions that I think we'll discuss on the panel and that I know that countries are um, currently discussing is to what extent should these innovations and adaptations continue um, in a post-COVID world? So were these just emergency responses or um, did the, um, the advent of the pandemic uh, sort of enable these innovations and acceleration of, of good ideas that should continue? So I'm sure we'll discuss that in, in the panel. And I just wanted to end with this, uh, these notes from the World AIDS Day report which notes through policy and service delivery innovation, and especially through the innovation of communities, the HIV response has in large measure risen to the challenge posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, ensuring continuity of services in the face of extraordinary impediments. And although COVID-19 is likely to have concrete negative effects on the trajectory of the HIV response, the ability of HIV programs to adapt inspires confidence that these negative effects could, with necessary investment, be short-lived. So I'd like to thank um, ICAP leadership and country teams and the Sequin Learning Network, all the people who um, gave these great examples and shared stories, um, and also to thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for their support of the Sequin Network. And thank you, thank you.
very much, Miriam, and uh, uh, for your presentation. And I'm sure some of the themes that you touched on, as well as Dr. Fauci test, uh, touched on, will also be um, will be addressed during our uh, panel uh, discussion. So let's move on now to the, our panel discussion for today. And I'd like to first introduce our panelists. And uh, the first panelist will be uh, Dr. Eleni Kutu. And she is the director of STI and HIV AIDS programs at the Mozambique Ministry of Health. Uh, welcome, Eleni. Uh, next, we also have uh, Dr. Carl Diefenbach, and he is the director of the Division of AIDS at the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease and works very closely uh, with Dr. Fauci. Next, we have uh, Stella Kintuzzi, and uh, Stella is the executive director of the National Forum of People Living with HIV Networks uh, in Uganda. Welcome, Stella. We also welcome Catherine Gugi, and uh, she is um, the head of the division, uh, National um, AIDS and STI Control Program, NASCOP, in the Ministry of Health in Kenya. Welcome, Catherine. And last but not least, welcome Jawindi Swinkme, and he's a Community Education Outreach Manager uh, for ICAP's Bronx a prevention center, one of the NIH uh, clinical trials uh, sites here in the United States in New York City. And also, of course, invite uh, Miriam to join us in the panel discussion. And I invite uh, all of our uh, listeners to please also continue to put your questions in the chat box. Okay, so I'll start by um, maybe a question uh, that I'll direct to um, to Catherine and to Eleni. And the question is that you've heard uh, about the many innovations that uh, have been put in place in uh, several of the countries uh, in response to modify the HIV programming in response to, uh, to COVID-19. And I'm just curious, as you reflect on these, uh, do, you, do you now have some evidence that some of these innovations are working uh, or not working? Are the data there? And um, how are you using these data in order to determine what you want to keep for the future post-COVID and what we need to um, kind of let go of as we, uh, as we move ahead? So maybe I'll start with uh, Eleni, you want to start, and then we'll move to Catherine. Okay. Uh, thank you, Wafa, and thank you, ICAP, for this opportunity. Uh, I believe that when we start, declare the first case of COVID in Mozambique, First, we have to issue a, a circular where we, we said that first we want to educate our patients and showing them to what, what is the importance of, uh, of uh, prevention of COVID. We also wanted to reduce the frequency of these patients to the, to the health facility. We wanted to reduce the time within health facility of these patients. Uh, and the last, we want to assure the continuity of the services in our health facility. Uh, to do that, we had to really install a dashboard where we could monitor every day, not every day, but every month, how we're seeing, what is the, the movement of our patients. And we saw it that from, the, from those dashboards that uh, we can monitor the filter patients. And these default patients were monitored every month. We saw that at, at the beginning of April, we increased the, the percentage of patients that were defaulting. So we have to act fast. And the first thing that we did was to re redo the flow in the health facility. We create a new, 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 new spots. We did our one-stop uh, models at uh, clinical offices where we can provide ARVs on those, on those, on those places. But also, what we did was uh, relaxing the criteria of three months drug distribution. We had a very very, very rigid criteria. What we, we had to do was really ease and relax those criteria. That came us to increase the number of patients three months drug distribution. And we saw that it was possible to relax those criteria. And most of the things that we did, and we expanded also the distribution through community. Uh, after we're doing those things, we're still seeing that patients were not coming to the health facility. We had to do so many uh, radio spots, TV spots, so we can say that it's important to continue as long as that we prevent against COVID, using the masks, uh, uh, making the distance for 1.5 meters, we have to wash the hands, all these things were important to be seen. We saw one of the posts that Miriam, Miriam did, just one of them, but we did for all of them, for adolescents, for adults, for pregnant women, we have to rethink what can come fast and be, and be, and be done. 
After that, we saw the drop in June, July of the default of patients, but we saw the impact on our indicators. That's why in August, we have to rethink and say, we have to go back and saying that continuity of service is very important. We have to do all the things. We saw the testing, the community service, all this community service, we, have to, we saw this rebound because we stopped to do a lot of uh, activities at community. So in August, we said, go back and do all the things that is necessary to do at community, mainly testing. So we can really start, continue to uh, find those that are HIV positive. And we did that. Now we are seeing that our indicators are again going back and, and, and growing. So what we did also is to keep, we said, we are going continue to service, but we're not going back to the normal. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do is that people are in their community, they have to protect themselves. We have to really screen if they have COVID or not, so it cannot be a vector of COVID from the health facility to the community. But also we had to keep the criteria that we relax in, in order of three months drug distribution. We kept the distribution of, on the spots, uh, like clinical consultation. And also we really are reinforcing that community drug distribution must go on, over. Interesting, thank you. That's very interesting how you've you've been very nimble and using the data to adjust and adjust again and adjust again and in order to be, uh, uh, to, to be able to maintain the quality of the program. So thank you for those insights. Uh, Catherine, what about in Kenya and uh, in the program in, in your country? And uh, did you face similar challenges and uh, what, how, how did you tackle um, the COVID crisis? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wanfa. And, uh, and ICAP for uh, this opportunity to share in Kenya where, where we are and how we were able to tackle um, it to ensure that you have continuity. So the effects definitely of COVID-19 um, period threatened, uh, you know, to reverse the gains in HIV programming due to the disruptions, you know, such as a lack of access to hospitals, uh, disengagement uh, of people living with HIV from care and interruption of VRT, you know, adherence. So in, uh, when we had the first case in around March, we, um, we did a circular for the, um, for the country uh, to ensure that we have continuity of the services. And the several areas that we touched on is to ensure that we have, especially our HIV testing services, we saw definitely, um, you know, to ensure that we have continuity, have so initial reduction of HIV testing volumes between March and, you know, April 2020, um, around 28% um, reduction. However, we used other means to ensure that we continue to have uh, the testing and identification of our clients. So utilizing uh, more of uh, HIV self-test kits and then you know, linking um, our clients to, uh, for the ART, uh, the ones who test positive to ensure that you link them for the ART uh, services. And then the second was to ensure that the clients were already on uh, treatment, the people living with HIV, we, we ensured that we give, we, we uh, clients who had, um, despite their, um, their, a, their age or the viral route suppression, we issued three month, month multi-month dispensing. And uh, that was in around March, April uh, and May. And then uh, despite the age, especially the children and, 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 and the adults. But as well uh, for prevention, mother child services, we had HIV testing uh, continuing but we were very specific to ensure some of the services um, continue. And we were a bit specific, for example, in viral uh, um, uh, testing and the EID to ensure that it is not disrupted. Mm -hmm. um, however, we note that some of those uh, uh, platforms that we have utilized, especially the technology ones, have been made very, very good, um, especially leveraging on the technology in the SMS platforms, the social media platforms as well. And, and as well, uh, ensuring use of mobile for, for medically assisted therapy services to continue in the country. And so we have had, uh, when we look at the impact for those last six months, we have seen at least stable uh, stability in our clients not missing the medication. Mm -hmm. And as well, viral load uh, suppression has been very, very good. And in the antenatal care as well, continuing. So we hope that even as COVID-19 you know, we relax issues. We want to continue on multi-month uh, dispensing. We want to ensure that we we maintain um, the momentum gained. That is one area, and ensure that as we revise our ART and differentiated care uh, delivery models, we ensure that we incorporate the rest of the plant. 
Mm -hmm. um, that is, we are utilizing HIV self-test kits. So we want to ensure that at least we uh, use uh, HIV self-testing not only within antenatal care, but as well within the other areas of, uh, of, of, of services within the facility. But more leveraging on the technology, you know, online platforms, social media groups, uh, and as well mobile uh, platforms, and as well rapid scale of the multi-month dispensing within the country. Thank you so much, Dr. Wafa. Thank you. That's very interesting. And I heard the word technology several times. And, and obviously, I think we're fortunate that, uh, uh, well, I guess maybe one silver lining is uh, in this pandemic is we do have at our fingertips technology like we're using today uh, for this meeting as an example. So thank you. Interesting. And you're right. I mean, I think just even trying to sustain where we're at is a challenge in and of itself. I want to turn now to Stella, and uh, Stella, I know that um, obviously the last several months have been must have been very tough for people living with HIV, um, and of course for also for organizations like your organization uh, that uh, that is there to serve and support uh, people living with HIV. And I'm just wondering how you've managed to continue your work uh, in Uganda uh, under the circumstances over the past several months with COVID. Yeah, thank you so much, Wafa, and thank you entire team for giving us an opportunity to share what recipients of care have been going through and us, the technical team that has been doing the coordination. COVID came with its challenges, what people call new normal, I call it near normal. We began with the total lockdown where people living with HIV were greatly affected. There was no transport. Accessing ART was a huge, huge problem. And the, it affected also the source of income. But along the way, there was some kind of opening up. And uh, with easing, now there is a, a very big scare with community infections. The fact that people living with HIV have HIV as an underlying cause, there is a lot of fear. We have lost some of people living with HIV. So this remains an ongoing problem. And uh, despite the fact that uh, COVID is on and we have had the challenges in line with the stigma, especially those who are not members of networks, people fearing to get to, to, to be seen at the next uh, health facility, issues around treatment literacy, if someone received the uh, medication that was different even if it is color or even the, the shape those were issues that we were experiencing but we were able to move on one we had to ensure that, that, that we did rapid surveys we did a rapid survey at the end of at the beginning of April and we did a second one on the at the beginning of, of July to understand the needs of people living with HIV so that when we are talking about how people living with HIV have been affected. We, we have the information, we have the data that would be able to inform our advocacy and even our partners when it comes to planning. And we indeed found out that people were affected. If you are locked up from a neighboring facility and you were to go there, the Minister of Health came up with one month refill and needed to get back as the lockdown went on. But at least the rapid surveys gave us an idea of the challenges that people living with HIV are experiencing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. But we also had a, a number of phone calls. We coordinated us to be able to share experiences, what was going on. If the people living with HIV had issues of accessing ART, then we were able to link up with implementing partners. We're actually grateful to most of the partners who even did the home deliveries. Mm -hmm. We also formed a WhatsApp group of most of the members. And this one actually became our easiest form, source of information because it was coming in real time. Even if we were experiencing a stock out, the stock out was reported and the national medical stores, including the implementing partners came in timely. And this was something that kept us going until when the lockdown was eased. Mm -hmm. It is still challenging because funding has also gone down People living with HIV have huge, huge expectations. They still have challenges of food, people lost income. 
but we are hanging in there, hoping and praying that something comes in quickly, although the biggest care now is that Uganda is experiencing high infection rate, the community infection rates, you are going through the, the election period, but we are hanging in there, the access treatment is now much easier, people have been able to be supported with some food supplements, but it is far from all over because there are 1.4 million Ugandans and the majority of these are quite vulnerable. Thank but you very much, Stella, and thank you again for, um, as you said, hanging in there and being the backbone to support uh, a lot of people living with HIV in Uganda. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn now to Carl. And uh, Carl, you have been, um, have kind of the, had the double challenge of sustaining, maintaining the HIV research momentum agenda at the same time also uh, sort of trying to do that at a time when there's also an immense mobilization uh, to expand also each COVID related research uh, to answer critical questions on therapeutics and vaccines and so on. And just wondering from where you are at, has how have you been able to and what are the challenges in juggling and maintaining both of these, uh, attention to both of these uh, pandemics at the same time? Thanks, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a really interesting uh, issue. The, the previous speaker talked about lockdowns and closings. I think that was one of the major challenges we faced very early on in the pandemic is our sites were closed, research facilities were closed. And then we realized by providing PPE, we could engage the sites in getting them involved in the coronavirus response within their institutions. That gave the institutions a degree of willingness to allow us at, for certain things to open for HIV research. Uh, so we had, we prioritized the research that needed to be completed. It's primarily the large studies where we had um, a huge sunk costs um, and we were able to move forward um, and carry out study visits, not just in the United States, but in Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in South Africa, for um, the vaccine trial uh, call in Bokoto. We we're able to keep this moving to a point where we actually were able to collect all the necessary data to satisfy a DSMV meeting. So by and large, it's been about prioritization, but at the same time, really everybody being so willing to double down and push very hard on coronavirus, particularly vaccines, monoclonal antibody therapeutics, and work on uh, outpatient therapies. So it's been it's been a struggle. It's been a, um, a, an incredibly busy time, but also an incredibly rewarding time for those of us working in HIV that we had the ability to step in and participate and lead um, the, this response. Thank you very much, Carl. And maybe now I'll I'll turn to uh, building uh, on what you just said. Actually, Jawindi, uh, you're uh, based at a at a clinical research sites, and you had to do exactly what Carl is saying in order to take care of uh, participants uh, uh, at a time of lockdown and so on. So maybe uh, you can uh, share some of your experiences and how you managed to support some of our participants in HIV research studies. Yes, and uh, thank you so much, Wafa, for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, uh, during my during my speech, I will always or my talk, I will always be referencing the Bronx Prevention Center. So I think it's important to highlight and let you guys all know that the Bronx Prevention Center is a community based research site located in the South Bronx here in New York City. And we are funded by the National Institute of Health and uh, we've been conducting HIV prevention research trials for close to 20 years. Um, we have a storefront location. Um, um, uh, designated um, and dedicated to providing um, clinical research. And most recently we acquired an additional storefront location just right around the corner from here um, that is primarily used for COVID prevention trials. And yes, um, I could piggyback off um, many of the panelists. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic here in New York City, our team uh, we worked off-site for a week, and during that time, uh, we use um, we discuss options on how to uh, maintain uh, 
continue to maintain participant visits. One of those options was sister site in Harlem. And um, we uh, just to temporarily forward our participants there. However, uh, we realized that that plan were met with um, lots of operational and logistical roadblocks. Um, logistics that would likely take longer to resolve than actually rescheduling our participants, you know, um, informing the IRB, reconsenting our participants and handling the pharmacy. Mm -hmm. So um, about a week later, uh, we uh, decided to come back to work on site in a modified way. Um, we scheduled participants in order of visit flow and visit windows. Um, and um, keep, of course, keeping in mind that we needed to be um, social distant. Um, and for the safety of the participants and staff, we only scheduled two participants on site at a time. And before participants came in, um, we called participants and asked them COVID uh, related screening questions, if they had a fever, if they had a cough, have they been around um, other people who tested positive for COVID. And um, we repeated those questions again um, once they came on site. Um, participants who came on site that did not have a mask, we had um, an abundance of a mask here to provide um, participants. We encouraged them to wash their hands while they were on site. And um, before the pandemic, participants used to come with their partners and come with their friends um, accompanied. And um, of course, um, after their study procedures were completed, um, we emphasized to our participants the importance of wearing a mask, the importance of hand washing, the importance of social distancing. Um, I think, Wafa, um, another challenge that we had uh, that we faced here at the Bronx Prevention Center uh, was uh, before the pandemic happened, participants gave us authorization um, to visit their homes in the event they missed a visit. Um, for example, we had uh, quite a few um, participants who live in shelters and we now we are not allowed to go onto the shelters and see the participants because of the own shelters policy and procedure. Mm -hmm. And that is a challenge that we still face today. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, however, now we are um, still reaching out to those participants, their other contacts, finding them on social media. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, one thing that this pandemic has forced us to, to do is to be creative um, and creative in the way we, we the Bronx Prevention Center staff, um, scheduled our participants, staffing and uh, retaining our participants by offering rides um, mm -hmm. by via taxis versus uh, them coming, those who were uncomfortable coming on public transportation. And we try our best to keep their visits as um, short as possible. Um, I think that um, it's important to note that we didn't coerce any of our participants to come in if they were not ready, that we met um, each participants where they were. Mm -hmm. um, those who participants who felt apprehensive about coming to the Bronx Prevention Center, um, we called them on a periodic basis um, to talk through any issues, to break down any bar uh, barriers that they may, had, um, may have had at the time. Mm -hmm. and the efforts that we put into modifying our operations at the Bronx Prevention Center were very critical in ensuring that the continued research in the field of HIV and, and COVID. Thank you very much, Jawindi. And again, it's the creativity and again, the nimbleness. Uh, uh, and in many ways, going back to you, Carl, I mean, just a comment that there's always been this your vision of these sites being pluripotent and uh, I guess with COVID, we've achieved that, that uh, these same sites are now doing uh, HIV research and COVID research and taking the lessons learned from HIV research now into, and the connections to the community into uh, uh, successfully being able to conduct COVID research as well. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, um, I moved to Miriam and Miriam, you've written and talked for, for years now about how there's so many lessons to be learned from HIV that could inform 
response to other health threats. I know we've talked about how the HIV response can inform the response to non-communicable disease as an example. Can you just talk about how all the lessons, what are the lessons from HIV and the response to HIV that can help us as we, or has, have helped us as we respond to COVID? So thank you for that question. Um, I think, so it's a, it's a, a complicated question, but focusing just on the DSD elements, mm -hmm. I think that we've already seen um, in countries in the COVID network and elsewhere, a rapid uptake of one DSD idea, which is the idea of multi-month dispensing. Um, so that is something that we're already seeing around the world for non-communicable diseases, as well as um, for HIV in, with the same rationale to try to uh, enable people to stay away from health facilities if they don't need to be there. It's not saying they can't come if they're ill or if they wanna see a physician, but they don't need to come to pick up drugs. So we're in, in many countries, not only people with HIV and NCDs, but also people just with NCDs are receiving rather than one month's worth of, of drug at a time, three and six months. That's sort of the conceptually simplest one and the easiest one to pivot quite quickly, assuming that drug supply chains can do it. I think that there's a lot of advocacy to also take the lessons learned about engagement of recipients of care and community-based and really community-led models from the HIV world into the NCD world. And that's where I think it gets a little more challenging and complicated. Yeah. It's interesting because I'm thinking back to something that Tony said in his talk, which is about, uh, you know, this issue of the vaccine hesitancy and particularly in, uh, among certain populations that are, uh, for legitimate reasons, mistrustful of research and so on. And we have a lot of lessons to be learned from HIV in engaging communities and engaging recipients of care. And uh, that could serve as well if we use those same principles in trying to engage um, uh, and use the same approaches we've, we've used to engage people in the vaccine conversation as well. Um, yeah, I think that's true within, again, I keep coming back to Sequin just because that's where my head is, but within the Sequin network, there's a community of practice which is made up of representatives of national and regional networks of people living with HIV. And those groups came together to develop a community engagement framework, um, which is available to share. But I think one of the big take home messages is don't engage us after the fact, mm -hmm. right? That, that communities need to be engaged at all stages in the conceptualization mm -hmm. of a program, in the design, in policy, in delivery, and in evaluation. Um, so I think that's maybe a sort of a, a bite-sized take home, which is that if we're thinking about whether we're thinking about addressing vaccine hesitancy or um, redesigning HIV programs or redesigning NCD programs, don't you know, sit in a room uh, with specialists and come up with a design and bring it to the community, bring the community into the room first. Thank you. Uh, that's exactly true, and that's I think that's the most durable lesson we've all had from HIV uh, over the past uh, several decades. I'm going to shift now to vaccines, and I think a lot of the audience questions uh, have been rightfully about uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, and, uh, and maybe I'll start by um, a question to Carl and then uh, open it up to others as well in terms of, there have been questions about, of course, the exciting news about the um, the two um, most recent mRNA vaccines, high efficacy, seem to be safe, and uh, other vaccines uh, be behind that. The question is, what about for people living with HIV? Do we know uh, whether these vaccines uh, are will be equally effective and safe in, in, amongst people living with HIV? Carl? At this point in time, we don't. Uh, we have been encouraging all the vaccine manufacturers to allow people living with HIV to be recruited and enrolled and randomized within the trials. Um, we got off to a somewhat of a bumpy start, but ultimately we persevered and were able to do that. To take a step back and think about the way the uh, Food and Drug Administration treats somebody living with HIV who's well suppressed on antiretrovirals, they view those individuals as norm normal healthy volunteers. Mm -hmm. And their immune systems are pretty intact. And so I think from the perspective of honoring people who have stayed with therapy, uh, by all means, um, they should be allowed to enroll and participate. I don't have, I don't think we'll see a problem. 
I think the immunosuppressed population from cancer and other diseases is a bit more of a concern. Um, and um, studies will have to be done in some of those populations um, as we move forward. That's true, as well as also other questions that were raised about pregnant women and children and so on, as well as also- Right, we have the special populations of children, um, pregnant women, uh, lactating women, all need to be done um, and done quickly. Great, thank you. And now going back to uh, Eleni and, um, and thinking about looking ahead in terms of you know, all that's been achieved in, in uh, securing uh, the HIV gains and so on. As you think ahead the, the next several months and uh, the concerns have been raised about, of course, um, uh, how, do, how do we sustain um, uh, the funding, the resources, and in many places, including in this country, um, what happens sometimes is people's attention focuses on the new problem uh, and the new problem is COVID and there's kind of a less focus on the established problems uh, that are still with us, uh, like in many places it's HIV or issues around maternal mortality or child mortality. How do you think as a, as a leader uh, within Mozambique, of how do we sustain the attention to HIV as we're thinking of the new UN AIDS, very ambitious 2025 um, targets ahead of us? Yeah, uh, I think the first step that we, we made is making laws and making analysis that the data is showing that we are dropping. And we show that, you know, look, uh, we are dropping here. We are dropping in terms of testing, in terms of new initiations, in terms of viral load, all these are dropping. So, uh, and we, and we are, have to show the data also, so more showing that Mozambique, we still, still have high infections. Mm -hmm. So 130,000 new infections per year. We still have 51,000 patients dying from from HIV complications. So, uh, and for this first, first of December, even the president was very clear. Yes, there is COVID, but we should think that HIV is not over. And everyone was like, oh yes, we are still people seeing new infections. We are still seeing uh, people dying from, from HIV. It's important to, to really talk about still talk about HIV. That's why we have this global solidarity and shared responsibility. I think the, 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 all this theme of UNAIDS for, for the 1st of December is really to call us and saying that we have to keep what we gain. We have to really move, move forward together and we have to take shared responsibility on the, what we are doing for COVID-19 and what we are doing for for HIV, and we 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 are having so many discussions. I remember Wafa when we were discussing all these this uh, these targets from UNAs. I was one of them saying that yes, let's talk about COVID. But I'm still here. There's still countries that did not reach even 1990. So those countries have to really keep fighting and saying that we have we have to make no so much noise and we're still making noise saying that hiv is still here and we have to go we are not saying that covid is not important but me also i'm important with hiv thank you Over. That's, that's fantastic and it's really wonderful to see leadership uh, your leadership but also leadership at the uh, at the national level by the president articulating this priority as well so thank you what about for you Catherine, in kenya um, how do you uh, think, how do we sustain this momentum? How do we think ahead? How do we keep an eye on HIV as an important epidemic uh, that has, is not gone? Thank you, Dr. Wafa. Um, I want to echo what uh, Dr. Irene has said, that despite the COVID-19 uh, being a pandemic, we still, the data still shows, and we still know that HIV is still a pandemic. Not that is that that not that we are not giving much attention to the um, to the COVID nineteen, but as well we know that our HIV um, epidemic that we still need to address it. So first is considering the data that we have. When you look at the 1990, most of our um, for example, give an example in the country Kenya, we still have a gap in the first 90, and the data shows that very well. So using the data that we have, not only programmatic data. But as well, uh, when you look like when you do the surveys, we still show that we still have big gaps. So when it comes to planning, we plan for COVID-19, but as well, and I'll echo words of Aline, we still continue making noise that we have our children still 
are contracting the HIV virus. We still need our pediatrics to be identified, be put on treatment. We still need them to have, to have virus suppression in the country. We still need to have our key populations in terms of the new infections, adolescents and young persons, all the gaps that we have, we need to address them. No forgetting a HIV is still epidemic. And then as well, we leverage. We have learned a lot with the uh, uh, HIV programming. In fact, most of the, for example, in Kenya, when we, we had the first cases, we utilize the platforms that we have in uh, HIV programming to ensure that we be able to attest to it, to, um, to deal with COVID-19. For example, I remember like the uh, echo platforms we have within the, the ministry. We use them to train more than 5,000 healthcare workers within the country. And, and as well, existing other mechanisms we have in terms of stigma and discrimination. I remember being asked, so how do we deal with this stigma and discrimination we are noting in COVID-19? How did you deal with it in HIV programming? So those are the areas that we need to ensure we learn the lessons from HIV, apply them to our COVID-19, but forget both of them are still important. And as well, we know that um, when you put our clients on the right treatments, they thrive like anyone else with HIV negative. You know, and we have medications right now that are really, really um, assisting our clients to ensure that they, they are able to continue with their life without having disruptions out of the OIs that they will be able to contract. But we still have a very good opportunity. And as well, DST, as I have said, has really opened our eyes. Is a, is a new way, virtual platforms. We have achieved a lot as a country and as globally using the virtual platforms right now. And thank you so much. Back to you. Victoria. Thank you, Catherine. That's so so interesting. And you're right. I mean, we we don't need to reinvent the wheel. I mean, uh, we've said that, and I know that's something that Miriam and I have said for years and years. There's so much global experience through uh, through the response to HIV that can really position uh, position all of us to do so much more. Um, and maybe Stella, going to you, and uh, the remarkable, uh, of course. Uh, uh, the assets of uh, people living with HIV and organizations like yourself uh, that have been really at the forefront uh, highlighting the centrality of, uh, of the importance of recipients of care. How do you see an organization like yourself um, assisting in the COVID response in, in, in Uganda, for example? Aza, thank you so much, Wafa. Well, one of the things that and as a country is uh, that we must integrate the two pandemics. We have HIV, it has been with us since the early 1980s. It is not going anywhere without a cure, without a vaccine. So COVID has also come on board. So we must be able to integrate. And the, as an organization that has community structures and also bearing in mind that COVID is spreading at community level, our biggest, our biggest call has been, let us involve the people who are able to roll back the HIV pandemic to be part of the national task force, to be part of the district force, to be able to involve even the people who have gone through this experience so that they support. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the, we keep on saying that there are actually three factors mm -hmm. to rolling back the COVID pandemic, just like the way the HIV pandemic was rolled back. And the three factors, we have community, we have community, we have community at this time. So as long as the community is involved, even when you are talking of where you are must sanitize, keep social distance, you're actually referring to the community. So as an organization of recipients of care people living with HIV, we still have many, many huge and discrimination, how we reduce, we are still struggling, but we are seeing a lot of stigma associated with COVID that people who have, who have suffered from COVID and have been injured actually, mm -hmm. the, the neighbors are running away from them. So we still have a lot to offer, but it goes back to the community because that is where the people are, whether living with HIV or having suffered from COVID, but also where the center of new infections are coming from, and we can integrate, learn from each other, mm -hmm. and do great work to roll back the two. Well, thank you very much, Stella. And uh, I always say when you're trying to tackle a pandemic, you should 
communication, communication, communication is very important. But you just taught me something even more profound, which is actually community, community, community. That's equally important. So thank you, uh, Stella. And uh, I realize we're running out of time. So maybe uh, I'll give um, a couple of words. I'll give Jawindi and uh, uh, maybe Jawindi, I think if, uh, can you, you're now involved in also trying to uh, recruit for, um, for COVID-19 studies. And maybe tell me like one, what's one thing that you've learned from your experience and with uh, reaching out to engage uh, uh, community members in HIV research, what's the one thing that you're taking with you and doing the same or applying it to trying to again recruit for COVID-19 uh, uh, studies? Yes, doc. thank you, Afa. I think uh, meeting the community where they are. Um, uh, we have participants who um, now uh, have to um, get an additional job um, because of the pandemic. So mm -hmm. we have um, staff now we strategically scheduling our participants. So now we have um, staff who comes in early at times. Mm -hmm. We have staff that come in late just to um, really meet, again, meet the community where they are. We even explored options to even open on weekends. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think um, uh, just being honest with the community, as honest as possible, um, and the community will put trust in you. Mm, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you, Joe Wendy. Indeed. Very profound. And uh, Miriam, uh, coming to you, and uh, again, as you look ahead to the future, and hopefully we can see on the horizon uh, better days, uh, but how do you, you know, kind of based on all these innovations, all the technology adoption, uh, does this position us even better to reach the 2025 targets? What do you think? I think it absolutely does. I think that, um, you know, we're, we're scientists, we want more data, we want to do more, you know, some, some research on, on the outcomes of, of some of these changes, but we've seen that the pandemic has broken log jams, that it's enabled people to make fast policy decisions that, you know, maybe in other contexts would have taken years to make. It's provided proof of concepts in countries where uh, DSD hasn't been implemented before. Um, and I think that, you know, overall, it's been successful in terms of retaining people in care, in terms of reaching people. And so I think that, um, you know, this terrible year of 2020, um, hopefully, uh, you know, after in a, in a post COVID world will have left us with some, um, some lessons learned. And, and again, I think that we want to avoid uh, the, the, that the only lessons learned is multi month dispensing. Um, it's really this holistic person centered approach to adjusting to sort of balancing the public health approach to HIV service delivery with the need to tailor it to the needs and expectations of, of people living with HIV. And so to keep in mind, there's sort of what can we do on the health system side in terms of streamlining, you know, multi-month dispensing, sort of using technology, but also always to make sure that we're listening to the communities that we serve when we're designing programs. Thank you, Miriam. And uh, maybe our last word from you, Carl, in terms of uh, where you are situated and how experience with HIV, but now with COVID-19 has um, in any, uh, I mean, I, how has it changed uh, the way um, you see the role of uh, the division of AIDS and, and you and your colleagues in, in the context of these two pandemics? I think what this has brought out is the ability, uh, you referred to this earlier, Wafa, of the, pulti, the pluripotency of our networks and the ability to come in and assist um, you know, the Division of Microbiology and Infectious Diseases has a group called IDCRC, which is a wonderful research network dealing with infectious diseases. The partnership with um, that team has been fantastic and continues to be so. So I think we're going to continue to be able to collaborate as needed. And I think um, there's just interest in all of us working together to beat this epidemic. I think the, the learnings from how we've do, been more efficient in terms of moving faster, in terms of protocol development, protocol design, protocol implementation, also in vaccine design and production of monoclonal antibodies should carry through to the new way. And so I see we should take the lessons learned 
um, both good and bad from coronavirus and fix what was bad and use in HIV research the things that were good um, and improve what we do. Thank you. Thank you. So, so very true. Um, we have been transformed, <laughs> all of us, in one way or another. Um, uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I want to end by thanking all of you who joined us today in observing this uh, unprecedented World AIDS Day in 2020. Uh, I want to also thank our panelists and discussants and presenters uh, for all of your insights, and uh, which have been incredibly important as we're tackling two pandemics at the same time. I always say that while we need to remain physically distant, we also must remain connected. And I hope that uh, we will continue to stay connected, stay safe, but stay connected as we move forward in, and hopefully in working extremely hard to um, maintain the momentum in the response to the HIV epidemic, as well as also at the same time, uh, be successful in confronting COVID-19. So thank you very much for all of your attention. Some thank you very much for all of your support and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. So